everyone. It's Mind Rolling. I'm back. Raghu, and I'm back with Noah Marcus, my son, who occasionally joins me to do some of these podcasts. And uh, usually it's because he really wants to talk to whoever it is I've lined up to speak with. And today it's our old friend, Robert Svoboda. Robert, welcome. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So... Uh, Noah has some stuff on his mind. That's why I thought he kind of represents next gen. And, uh, well, yeah. You, you always say that. I'm, yeah, I'm because it, deny it. Yeah, well, it makes me feel better, okay, to say that, considering what gen I'm in. Right? Yeah, most, sure. more recent gen than our gen. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, I'm sure he's going to have uh, some interesting perspective in terms of what uh, you might help. Um, elucidate for people to, you know, mind rolling is all about getting life in balance. That's my central theme. So, uh, but before I'm going to let uh, Noah have at it, I, I, as I just said, I was skimming through uh, Law of Karma. For those of you who don't know, Robert has this wonderful trilogy, uh, Agora. A G H O R A, and we're going to have links in the show notes so you can, you know, easily find it. And uh, I mean, I don't want to get, because Robert's been with us before, and he's been with us at retreat. So, uh, and and many of you who have uh, who follow Krishna Das, they have spent some nice times together as well. Uh, so, but Robert was in India not long after we were, we were there early 70s. He was there a little bit later, mid 70s, and uh, met an incredible being, a teacher named Vimalananda, an Agora, Agori. And uh, those books are uh, a, an exposition of his time with Vimalananda, incredible teachings, incredible practice. And I urge you all to go out there and get these, uh, this trilogy. It's just fantastic. So the last part of it is called The Law of Karma. And Robert and I did something on this a so, year and a half ago or so. And uh, I just went back to it. I said, I've been thinking about, boy, a bunch of karma is exposing itself uh, to us all over this last year, both individually and collectively. But, um, and I, uh, part of what I like to do here is just get this down to a really uh, down to earth understanding of these things. Now, karma is not, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's funny because it is what people think, right? You, uh, you know, pop someone in the head, you're likely to get popped back at some point, some lifetime, <laughs> something is going to, you know, is going to happen. But it's far more subtle than that. And the subtlety that uh, an understanding that Vimalananda had of it is 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 pretty amazing, absolutely amazing. So, so, but we're going to have to use a couple of words, everybody, that are really out there. I can't even pronounce this word in particular, which is really central to understanding. After reading this book, uh, karma, and the book, uh, the word is rather, it's. Nanu Bandana. So I don't know where the R goes, Robert. How do you pronounce that? It's Renanu Bandana. Renanu Bandana. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so my understanding is it's, it uh, is bondage of karmic debt. Right? Is that a general? I mean, that's from the glossary. So that's a that's a literal because literal. that the first word, you know, in Sanskrit they like to take words and put them together, kind of like the Germans do, and form new words. So the word runa, R N A, uh, that means debt, huh. and anu bandana, anu. Anuk is a prefix that can mean many things, but it generally is suggests something that is made smaller or personalized or individualized. And bandana, um, bandana means a bond or bondage. Uh, in English, we have the word kummerbund, and kummerbund. Kumbar in Hindi means your waist. 
So a cummerbund is a bondage for your waist. Hmm. So runa anu bandana means that connection between two people, a person and an animal, a person and a place, uh, a, a, between any two, any two things, a connection that has been created as a result of karmic debt. And karmic debt happens when, um, wh when I give something to you, when I take something to, from you, when I do something to you, when I permit you to do something to me. Any the word karma in Sanskrit literally means action any kind of action. But as modern physics tells us, every action is going to produce some kind of effect in the fabric of the universe as, the, as we know it. And that effect sometimes can be predicted and very often is totally unpredictable. Um, have you ever heard of the three body problem? No. Um, there is a, a, probably the most famous Chinese science fiction writer uh, has written a trilogy. It may even, I forget, I've read the first book of it so far, and it was very complex and, and well written. I think, in fact, it was called The Three Body Problem. And it's based on the fact that if you have two two particles, two atoms, two billiard balls, whatever they are in space, and you start this one moving and you start that one moving, if they're just two of them, they you can predict uh, from now into the future wh what is going to happen to them, where they will be, what kind of velocity they will have based on the ba the principles of physics, how much friction you have, how, what is the likelihood they'll intersect, and so on. But if you add even one more particle, even one more thing, you can't predict it. It becomes impossible to predict. And so in our world, I mean, forget the fact that we have 10 sextillion stars in the universe. On this very single planet that you and I are living on, we have 7.4 billion humans in which there are trillions of human cells, trillions of micro, microbiome cells, and that doesn't count all the non-human animals, all the plants, all the single-celled things, all of the everything that's out there. So tr there is no way to predict specifically with perfection how what the results of karma of one action is going to be. You can have a reasonable expectation, but you can't, uh, you can't perfectly predict it. And that's why they say in India that even the gods themselves cannot understand the law of karma mm. perfectly. I mean, all of us can understand it to some degree, and that's why all the major religions have, have issued some kind of version of the golden rule. If you want to, Jesus put it, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And of course, the emphasis should have been more like, if you do, whatever you do unto others eventually is going to be done unto you. But of course, Jesus didn't write these things himself. Somebody else wrote them decades afterwards, and they were not at the same level of awareness that he was. And so naturally, we've come up with it that way. But the practical reality is all religions say, if you want good things to happen to you, do good things. If you're prepared for bad things to happen, go ahead and do bad things, but you're going to regret it in the future sometime. Mm, yeah. So, and then inimitable to this is uh, the concept of self-identification with actions. And uh, what Vimalananda says, when an agori eats meat and drinks wine, for example, 
he doesn't bother about it. He thinks to himself, because of Ranunan... Ranunabandana. Ranunabandana. The body must do these things, paying off a debt. I offer it all to you, to the deity. But if when you eat meat, meat, you think, ooh, how delicious, I like it, then you are lost. Finished. Karma will cling to you like mud. It is better to be like the lotus which rises out of the mud, but it is not defiled by it. Mud cannot stain or soil a lotus. As long as you fail to send, as long as you fail to self-identify, you can remain a witness to everything you do while your body continues to fill its rananu bandana for as long as it Good. continues. It's better. Uh, but it is so easy to, but is it so easy to act without self-identification? No way. Try, he didn't say that. I did try to, try to enjoy sex without self-identification and you'll see how hard it is. Uh, and talk a little bit about the reality of that in our day-to-day -day life, the way that we do, I mean, we, you know, our friend Krishnadas calls it the movie of me. You wake up in the morning and that's it. You are gone, producer, director, writer, protagonist, blah, 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 24-7. Uh, and uh, this is extraordinarily a, a, a huge affectation um, on becoming completely identified with whatever it is that we're doing. And so, talk about that. One of the things that Femalananda often said was that life is nothing but memory. If you don't have memory, you, you, uh, your body may be alive, but, but there's really no you there anymore. And we see this, of course, with people who have dementia, people with Alzheimer's. Physically, they're still there, but, but that personality is no longer there. The personality is no longer able to present itself as an individual. And so that's what the ego is doing. The ego is taking all of our different sub-personalities, and we all have different sub-personalities, um, I'm a different person with um, my friends than I am with my sister. You're a different person, Raghu, with Noah than you are with other people because you have different Rananubandana. You have different karmas. You have, you have, you have created a, a relationship, an alignment that... that in which you would you identify yourself as a slightly different person than you do when you're interacting with someone else. So the job of the ego is number one, to create all these personalities by remembering who we are individually, remembering who other people are, remembering how to find your keys, where you live, all of the other details of life, and, and concocting all this together, putting it in the oven, baking it 450 or so. And then you come out with this thing that you believe is, uh, is real. And of course, to some degree, it is real, but it doesn't have permanence. And that's where the problem begins. The problem is that people believe in their personalities as, as being permanent. And, um, and, and we see this in uh, various people believe that they're going to lose their bodies, but on the day of judgment or whatever it is, they're going to get the same body back and the same personality, and they will re remain that way indefinitely. Um, and other people believe that they will die and be reborn, but that that personality will somehow come back and be very similar to the personality they're going to be. And sometimes this may be the case for a while because of, of certain strong karmic conditioning, but ultimately 
everything else in the universe is changing, you're going to change also. And the, the challenge that we have is that people tend to get stuck in the parts of themselves that they like and want to hold on to and the parts of themselves that they don't like and would like to get rid of. Um, and, and this is why uh, I think the, the, the tantric and agora approach has some uh, particular utility to it because its concept is what we need to do is uh, not simply change the personality so it's better or not so bad, but rather to, to, to find a different way to employ the, um, this force, we call it uh, the ego, or in Sanskrit, ahankara, when it's identifying with us, and we call, it's the same force we call kundalini when it is trying to go back and identify with the supreme reality. Um, it's just a difference of direction. Mm. Um, but as Vimalananda would also say, you know, there is simply no way you can remain alive as a human being without an ego because that's the thing that keeps your body integrated. There's lots of pathogens out there. There's lots of bacteria. There's lots of other things that look at you as a giant uh, buffet, and they would like to consume you immediately and enthusiastically, and there's all kinds of insects, and there's all kinds of predators, and all sorts of everything. They're just, they look at you as, as a large um, meat meat on the hoof, as it was. And, and the, the, the ego, its job is to, to protect us against being consumed by all of these pathogens. So it has to be extremely forceful and it has to be extremely uh, uh, intent on its job. And of course, that's part of the reason why personalities tend to get very, very stuck because that's one of the ways that people use to create stability in themselves. An easy way to create, well, it's not real stability, but it appears to be stability, is just to be totally stubborn, believe that your way is always right, close your mind completely, and then you don't have to think about anything else, at least until something comes and destroys your world completely, and then you realize that uh, you must have made a mistake somewhere. But until then, you don't have to think about that because your mind is completely closed and you're completely focused on your de self-definition, your imagination of who you are, and therefore everything that you do will be a karma for you and you will be moving ahead, creating your next, uh, your next lifetime and the next lifetime and the next lifetime, good or bad, according to whatever it is you're doing. Mm. Um, and so, and so the question is, what do we do about that? And um, according to Vemla Nanda, at least, and and. I believe that this is accurate. There are two basic things that we can do. And these are the two basic types of spiritual practice that exist, at least in India, and I would think pretty much anywhere. One approach is you figure out a way to, and either, well, both approaches require you to fi find out a way to minimize your ego so that it is doing everything that it needs to do in order to keep your all of the different parts of your body integrated and functioning. So 
that's all it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to be creating this image that is a stuck image of who you are and where you're going to, and that it should not be doing. It should be working only at the level of the reptile brain, which is why Kundalini is regarded as a snake. She's the reptile brain. And that's where the ego needs to work. The ego should not be working in the emotions. The ego should not be working in the rational thinking. These things are, should be associated with the ego only very, very subtly and very tenuously and with an understanding that they are that the uh, uh, an awareness of the degree to which they are egoic so then once you've got to that point once you have the ego taking care of your physical body to the minimum extent that it is required then you have two options one is um the option of uh, the, the, the traditional Vedic way of doing things, which is, um, which is uh, often called neti neti. Neti is not the same as the neti pot. Neti means na iti. It is not this. So na iti, it is not this, it is not that. So you identify each of those things that you think you are, and you recognize internally that, in fact, I am not any of those things. My body is doing these things. The ego is doing what the body is, whatever the body is required to do, the body is doing those things. But I'm not the body. The body is going to be gone at some point. It's going to die. And when the body dies, that doesn't necessarily mean I will die. It All it means is uh, is that, as Lord Krishna said, you change your clothes when your clothes are dirty and you put on some new clothes. You change one body when that body doesn't work for you anymore. You put on a new body you, you, and you continue to act according as to the, to the actions that are required by your Rananubandhanas. So that's one approach. Vimalananda appreciated this approach Though he did say that in Kali Yuga, this was a much more difficult approach because of the amount of maya, which um, comes from a root, a Sanskrit root that means to measure. So maya is the tendency that we have as human beings to always keep measuring things. I am like this. I am rich. I am poor. I am handsome. I am ugly. I am clever, I am stupid. It's all a matter of measurement. I am hot, I am cold, all measurement. Maya and moha. Moha means delusion. So the delusion usually comes as a result of the measurement. You identify with these conceptions that you've created and that identification in, uh, it promotes the, the karmas whose results you are not going to be happy with later on. So that's one way. But Vimalananda would say that it's more difficult to do neti neti during Kali Yuga because there is so much maya, so much moha. It is, it is very difficult not to identify with something. And that's why he was much fonder of the concept of minimize the ego, create what he called a spiritual vacuum, and then request a deity to enter into you and act through you. So, and of course, it's easy to hallucinate or dream that you're doing this, and a little more difficult to actually be possessed but if you can be possessed by a deity, uh, and that in itself takes some, some effort, and then making that relationship stable takes some effort. But if you can do that, then the deity will act th th through your body, and you can remain 
in the body as a witness, as a sakshi, enjoying what is being done, but without associating yourself with those actions and therefore not having to receive the karmic results from them. Can we take this to, uh, not to get to, um, not to misuse some of the reality of what uh, <coughs> Ananda is uh, you're um, sharing with us. But if we talk about self-identification as being a central issue, which I think everybody can agree with that, uh, and we talk about the practice you just mentioned, neti neti, which is weird because, not weird, but I haven't heard it in a while, I, it's uh, Ramdas when he first came back from India, he was using this practice and he used to talk to us and teach neti, not this, not that, neti, neti, you know, just develop the witness as you do that particular practice. And and as uh, Vimalananda said in, in the Kali Yuga, of course, that's, that is uh, gyan yoga is a difficult uh, path. But if we take it, I, I'm just thinking of us, us that came from, uh, went with back to India with Ramdas. Second time he went back and met Neem Karoli Baba, and you you are very well informed, I know, about our trip, uh, and um, we came back with bhakti, so using the opening of the heart to. Um, to actually, uh, in the way that you're talking about, and you know, this is where I may be mis misusing words, but the way in which we used Neem Karoli Baba as a deity and Hanuman, basically, and went through and brought that into us and through us through the practice of, say, Hanuman Chalisa and so on, was to me uh, very much. Uh, and I may again, I may be wrong. It's not what Vimalananda was really talking about, but to, in some small way, I think it is, at the very least. And at the same time, interestingly enough, we all were, uh, not all, but many of us were taking teachings from uh, Buddhism, Buddhist teachings, and we became very close to Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein and 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 hanging out with the Tibetans and so on. And that seemingly was, um, although he never told us to do anything, somehow we were all doing it while we were with Neem Karoli Baba. So that, that combination, which if you boil it down to, um, in terms of self-identification, of using mindfulness to create, uh, Ram Dass would call it a loving awareness witness, uh, so that you are not falling into that self-identification uh, so much of the time that there becomes, there's a gap opens up, there's some spaciousness around it. And uh, that that, alongside of using what I just described in terms of bhakti yoga, does that make sense relative to what Vimalananda was uh, sharing? It makes complete sense because um, it, it, he 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 talked quite a bit about the bhakti marga and the jnana marga the path of knowledge and the path of devotion um and he often would uh talk about it in the context of the two nostrils the left nostril representing bhakti and the right nostril representing jnana and um, and honestly, that's I mean, there is something hormonal about that because the right nostril activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight cortisol nervous system, and the left nostril activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calm down, uh, nurture, nest, uh, be juicy. Um, uh, oxytocin and sex hormone nervous system based very, 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 very uh, simplistically. But he also pointed out that 
it is very useful to have two nostrils and they are there for a purpose. You need both of these things. And just because someone follows the path of jnana, if they follow the path of jnana with no bhakti, then they're going to become either extremely arrogant and very uh, uh, and very uh, ruthless, um, like the sun out in the middle of the desert. Uh, the sun is a great thing, but uh, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the desert, you don't want to be out under it unless you want to be uh, roasted. Um, and so if, if even if you follow the path of jnana, you need to have uh, you need to have an open heart so that you don't become so that you don't lose your compassion so that you don't lose your ability to relate to the simplest people around you who are not as advanced as you are which is all too often what uh, I've seen in people who attempt to become uh, filled with jnana and start to try to uh, display that in some way. Mm -hmm. And from the other end, even if you follow the path of bhakti, that doesn't mean that your personality has been completely transformed until it is so transformed that there is no you left anymore, as was the case with Neem Karoli Baba, for example. For him, there was, there was nothing like he didn't bother with having his own personality because Shiva was there or Hanuman was there or Rama was there. Whoever was there, whenever, it was, whenever, it need, he, whenever that personality needed to be there, would be there and would move him around and do whatever needed to be done. And um, so uh, Vimalananda absolutely believed that anything that you do to assist you to, to broaden your awareness, to, re to remove the things that are interfering with you perceiving the totality of reality, that those were good things to do. So he believed in, he believed in, in any kind of, of spiritual practice, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, uh, Buddhist, uh, anything, as long as it worked. Um, and I think that this is a, a general feeling in India also, even among the different people who believe in, uh, some believe, follow bhakti and some follow jnana. There is a, 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 you know, there were five uh, acharyas of Advaita Vedanta. Most people think about Shankaracharya as Mr. Advaita, but he was only number one. Number two was uh, Ramanuj Acharya. Number three was Nimbarak Acharya. Number four was Madhava Acharya. And number five, my personal favorite, was Vallabhacharya. So, wait, just so we get uh, the uh, expression is non duality in. The right. Yeah. But the different varieties of non-duality. So according to, and of course, here's where the jnana comes in, because to what extent is something non-dual? Um, uh, Shankaracharya used to say, Brahman Sat Jagan Mitya. So the supreme reality that has no qualities, no ma no attributes, no characteristics. That is sat. Sat means it exists. Sat means it is real and true. Jagan mitya. Jagan means the manifested universe, and mitya means it is it is wrong. It is it is even though it is created out of something true and real, it is. It is not at all true and real. Wrong view. No. Wrong view. Yeah. Whereas <clears throat> Vallabhacharya, for example, his teaching was Brahman Sat, Jagan Sat. Because he, his opinion was 
anything that is created out of something that is real must also be real. It may not be permanent. It may not be transcendent and cover the entire cosmos like the Brahman, the supreme reality does, but that doesn't mean it is any less real. So there have been arguments about this for, well, ever since Shankaracharya, that was 1300 years ago. And um, everyone has their own opinion. But Vallabhacharya, who was uh, himself a very great no, uh, Sanskrit expert, wrote many beautiful hymns in Sanskrit, uh, and wrote a number of commentaries, as did Shankaracharya, as did uh, Ramanujacharya. Uh, at one point, uh, Vallabhacharya just, he said one simple phrase, uh, simple in Sanskrit, four words, Jnani Chet Bajet Krishna. Jnani Chet Bajet Krishna. And what that means is the ideal devotee, that's implied, but it doesn't actually say that, but that's implied. The ideal devotee will, will, be, will appear if someone who is a Jnani, who has real knowledge real spiritual knowledge of what that of the what the supreme reality really is if that person takes that knowledge and then uses it to worship krishna that person will become supreme mm. right wow so now um i mean we'd have to be here for about 16,000 podcasts to really <laughs> get this I mean, I've wanted to, I mean, just, I had just, this is all predicated by a, a couple of pages from this book that hmm, started me thinking along that, uh, the ideal of, of, of particularly around, you know, the karmic debt and uh, self-identification, which is such, you know, how, and then how do we, how do we transform and what does that mean transforming so you you did another phenomenal job robbie so great yeah. but now i got to turn it over to noah who's um who's going to take it into another realm i think i'm going to take it back to like the third grade level we'll we'll see <laughs> uh actually can i ask uh well a, a couple questions from what i vaguely understood you two just to be talking about please do uh Karmic debt, uh, and I, I feel like this question has probably been asked to you before. Can it be carried across lifetimes? Um, as I understand it, uh, yes, it can go on from lifetime to lifetime for, to lifetime. And as Vimalananda explained it, it wouldn't be so complicated if it was just a matter of um, I borrowed uh, you know, a cup of oats from you. And then in the next lifetime, I paid you back a couple of oats. I mean, a cup of oats. It's more like I borrowed a cup of sugar. You took a cow. Um, I moved into your house. Uh, you chopped down my tree. So it's not just one thing. It's a bunch of different things that create a, a thicket or a, a mat or a carpet of all kinds of different things whose, whose karmic fruits are being delivered at different times and from different angles, maybe not all directly from you, but by someone who you had shifted part of that karma over to, and then that karma, uh, it, so it becomes then really, really complicated. Yes, and it's yeah. because it's so complicated that it can definitely go on from one lifetime to the next because untangling the, you know, getting a Persian carpet and trying to undo all of those hundreds of thousands of knots, uh, it takes a long time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, and then my other question, or actually I just, I, I loved the concept of the spiritual vacuum. Uh, is that like, 
the end goal of of all this of practice basically is that what maharaji was a spiritual vacuum that's and i'm speaking for myself here that that's that's what i feel um when when i when i focus on him and and of course i'm never had the the blessing to be able to meet him in person but um I've always strongly felt his presence at at the at that I don't know what you would it's not an ashram but it's that thing on the um uh on the uh parikrama marga the uh, in Brindavan uh, there's a path that you walk around to do a circumambulation of the of the town and at the southern part, or I think it's the southern part of that path, there's a a temple to him. And I've always felt a strong, you know, a, his presence there very strongly. And so I'm taking that as my, you know, as the as an indication of what I believe really was his presence. And for me, I've always felt like his, his that that he was there, but he was there allowing his body, because as Vimalananda used to say also, um, when, when, if, you really, if you really, really love someone, then what you're doing is you were, it's, and he used to say that Vishnu's greatest devotee is Shiva, because Shiva gives everything away to Vishnu. You want to wear good clothes? I'll wear ash. Uh, you want to have all the uh, beautiful looking uh, uh, angels around you. I'll take all the evil spirits. Uh, you want to live in a, uh, you know, on a, a thousand headed snake and have Lakshmi massaging your legs. Um, I'll live in the smashan and the cremation grounds. So someone who's a real devotee doesn't want anything for themselves. They want everything to be given to them so that they, they can offer it away and and the more that you make those offerings the less there is of you to offer so to me yes i mean that that's what i feel when i connect in with maharaji's energy is that he was just always and he would always be saying he would always be writing ram 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 he was focused on ram and he was just allowing Ram to be present in him because he didn't want any part of himself to be there. All he wanted was for Ram to be there. That's great. Do you, do you feel the, the same of your guru, of the Malayananda? Yes. That he was a, a, a vacuum? Yeah. Definitely. And he was an unusual character because he was very fond of Sometimes he would bring in uh, this saint, and sometimes he would bring in this deity, and sometimes he would bring in somebody else. He made it a point to bring in different personalities to do different things all the time. So he was, it was not always easy to know who was there. You know, sometimes you could identify who was there. Sometimes he'd let you know who was there. And sometimes it was just like, Somebody would show up from who knows where and do something and head off somewhere else. That's great. Amazing. All right. Uh, so I know we're, we're starting to get a little low on time now. So let me no, switch we're it cool. We, we've we're got... cool. All right. Um, I, I, you, a couple weeks ago, we put out a podcast from you that was about intuition. And well, maybe it was a, about a couple weeks ago, a month ago or so. Uh, who can remember? I mean, we're in 2020 <laughs> has been, some weeks have been a year long and the whole year yeah. feels almost like it was last week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but anyway, that's it, intuition. It, it is something I've been trying to uh, work on a, an article for the uh, foundation on this subject for a little while. Uh, and I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit and, I, I captured a couple of quotes from your podcast. Uh, and so let's see, this, this is you. As we've become urbanized, as we have disconnected ourselves from the natural world, 
we've also disconnected ourselves from our ability and it's a natural ability that all living beings have to be aware to some degree or other of what's coming toward us so yeah is is technology cutting off our our intuition is it a cutting our connection to the natural world in, you know, scary ways. <laughs> I, I don't think that technology has to do that. But I certainly think that is the, that seems to be the general effect of what is happening. And part of the, part of that reality simply happens to be that, um, we only have so much territory in the brain. And um, it has been shown in, an, in, many, in many different people uh, over many parts of the world that when you have a, a culture that is completely oral, people can memorize lots and lots of things because you're not con you're 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 not uh, uh, putting it down on paper or 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 a rock or metal. You're not externalizing it. And once you start to become literate, and you start to rely on external things to uh, uh, preserve your knowledge then a certain amount of your brain has to be taken up by this translation mechanism by which you convey, uh, you, can, you convert memory into a complex set of symbols, and, and then you convey those symbols, you put those symbols somewhere, and then you can pick those symbols up later. Now, in some ways, this is very useful. Without that, we would not have had the Rosetta Stone and we would not have had the Ashoka Edicts and we would not have, we're able to know so much about the past. We're able to, to some extent, remember what happened in the past because people were leaving these, these indications that can speak to us even thousands of years later. On the other hand, that means the very fact of being able to do that has caused our memories to become dramatically reduced. So now we've gone to the extent that we are employing technology and particularly, in particular, we're employing screens. And it used to be that you had an alarm clock and you had a flashlight and you had a calculator and but now everything is here it's one stop you don't have to do anything else and therefore quite naturally because you keep going to the same thing all the time you develop a stronger relationship with it than you might have done with all these 25 other things that it is now doing for you so it is demanding your attention, number one. And demanding your attention means other things. You only have so much attention. So it can drag your attention even more effectively than other things can. And so your attention and where your attention goes, your prana goes also. Now your prana is going into the screen, into that giant pranic holding tank that is the Internet. And because we are using this screen, chiefly, yes, you have to hold it unless you have a, you know, a stand for it, but you're using your ears and your eyes mainly. Your ears and your eyes are in your head. So the focus of your prana is more and more in your head. It was already bad enough because we were thinking, we were reading, we were writing, we were talking. But at least talking, you talking, you know, communication between humans is one third verbal and two thirds, uh, you know, body language and 
pacing your words and other things that are not exactly verbal. Um, so at least there was, you know, but in a text, there is no body language. In a text, there is, I mean, the, you, you can make sure, you know, don't put capital letters there so you, it's obvious you're not shouting. And don't write capital K period unless you want to insult somebody if you're trying to just say, okay, you know, we find these things out. But, but otherwise, the emotions have been taken away. The body language has been taken away. So it's very much a head-oriented thing. And, uh, and that's why I like to say that we're living in a world where Rahu, which is the, a, a astrological force that makes you imagine things and live in a fantasy world and be completely disconnected from the real world, Rahu is possessing people left and right. And, and so I think it is very much the case, even though technology itself is a neutral thing, just like electricity, um, I believe we're using technology in a way that is making us, number one, go further and further away from the real world. And number two, um, it's something that's reinforcing our personalities. It's reinforcing our biases. Um, I saw The Social Dilemma a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I knew that algorithms were very powerful things. And I knew that, you know, that, but I didn't quite understand just how enthusiastically the algorithms were actively forcing you into only hearing the opinions that um, you already believed in. So in that way, those algorithms are really a very anti-spiritual sort of thing. Because that's, it's taking a personality that already is kind of tarnished and it's just reinforcing, it's making that personality more and more uh, uh, stiff <clears throat> and fossilized and stuck and unwilling to explore anything other than what it already believes in. Mm. So that's not a good sign. Um, so, and because your intuition if you want to access your intuition, you can only do it from your Hara point down below your navel. You have to be able to connect to your Hara point. And if you're only up here, you're breathing from up here, you're not even getting your prana down to your navel. So you're not going to have any intuition if you're not even connecting to that part of your body. Um, so... Is there any way to incorporate this technology into our lives more skillfully, more wholesomely? I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm using, we're using this technology right now. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, f for me, and I think that this is probably, I think this probably applies to most people. Um, I think it's very important to, I think, I personally think it's very important to limit the number of platforms you actively interact with. So, um, because each one of those platforms, if you're actively interacting with it, requires some attention to be paid to it every day. And, um, and I think it's important to limit the amount of time that you interact with that and make sure that you fit in time every day that you are out, even if it's just taking a walk, even for half an hour in the natural world, you're back in the natural world. You're breathing air. Okay. I mean, I'm in a 7 million person metro at the moment, so the air is not exactly great, but at least it's real air. At least they're real plants. And 
in the house here, there's some real plants also, but it's nice to see them actually in the ground and connected to, and there's, okay, we don't see a lot of uh, animals other than dogs and cats and, you know, the occasional raccoon, possum, and down here, armadillo, but it, and maybe a skunk here and there, but at least they are real, authentic, non-human things. So we're around humans much too much. And I think it's very important to be spend some time every day in the non-human world trying to avoid. And why, look, the dog just showed up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it when things show up on cue. Um, and, 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 and so, and, and have that, have an intention, express your intention to the universe that, uh, I would like very much, O oh universe, to keep connecting to you on, in a natural and honest to, uh, you know, genuine way, connect my piranha. And, and I would like uh, very much for every sentient being to be able to do that also. And so maybe that's not going to happen anytime soon, but I can express that to the universe. That is a karma. I admit that I am identifying myself with it. But in this particular case, I think that's a karma that I'm responsible to perform as a human being today to try to encourage the human race to move in the right direction. Because it sure, as far as I can tell, ain't moving in the right direction at the moment. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> no. Um. All right, we have time one more. more. We got time for more. one more. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I, I this is another quote from you. I, I I don't even know if there's a question here. It's it's definitely connected to the technology stuff we we've just been talking about. But I, I just wanted to read this because it's awesome. Uh, so here it is. Uh, we have ended up in a place in our world where it is not so much a totalitarian political system that is telling us what is real and what is false. It is a totalitarian media system made out of totalitarian algorithms that is creating little echo chambers in which people are being told that what they believe is absolute truth and they're only being exposed to other people who believe the same thing. So, yeah, that's a little bit. Of, we just touched on that a little bit. But sorry, I just I, I love that quote. It, it stuck out to me and I wanted to uh, really address more people. Uh really addresses the polarity that is so endemic, does it not? It does. And, um, you know, uh, th there's, I used to, uh, let, let me just say that you and I, all of us humans and animals and so on, we're all carbon-based life forms. And uh, the internet is a silicon, except it's not just silicon. It's also now gallium arsenide and all kinds of stuff like that. It is a mostly non-carbon-based form that has a kind of a semblance of life to it. And it is not, however, a carbon-based life form. So there is a definite difference between it and us. And it is mirroring us, but Vimalananda, you know, he always used to say, people have created machines, and those machines they created as their servants. But the law of karma being what it is, there will come a point when those servants will turn humans into their servants. And I used to think, oh my, that's going to be some sort of Terminator-like experience where, in fact, machines, and some people still believe, they will eventually become intelligent, etc. And then I th after a while, I thought, nah, that's not going to happen. Then I thought, well, what will happen is people, some people will start getting chipped and they will start having, you know, connecting their nervous systems to uh, find some ways to create interfaces between their nervous systems and uh, external things. 
And it's it's going to be, you know, them who are acting as the real slaves to the machine. But now it's not really the machine so much as it's the algorithm. So so now it's something that's even subtler than the machine. An algorithm is a machine. A machine is anything that does work. So it used to be we had to think of things that were mechanical that did work. You had a typewriter and, you know, you had these keys that went like that. And that was very impressive. And everybody thought, whoa, that's the end in a technology. Of course, that was not the case. Then it became electric. Then it became a computer. And, and, and now there's voice recognition. And I'm sure there will be thought recognition at some point. Mm. So... It's not a, it's not a, it's it's still a machine but it's a much more subtle sort of machine and the subtler it gets the easier it is especially for if someone's awareness is not very subtle the easier it will be for it to get in there and possess a person and drive them around as if they were completely under the control of whatever it is they've opened themselves up to so in the past, you had to mainly be worried about being possessed by uh, a dead ancestor or a dead person you accidentally picked up somehow in the cremation ground or being possessed by an emotion or something like that. Now it's this sort of out the algorithms are going to start possessing people. I mean, they've started already, but they're, it's going to become more and more that way. And it's going to be a much subtler kind of force and a bigger challenge, I think, for all of us to to address it. Um, and the only way to address it, of course, is by bowing down, surrendering to the supreme reality. And if you're a bhakta, like I am, surrendering to the guru and to the ishta devata, the personal deity, and say help <laughs> yeah that's the last word here amen to that help <laughs> uh, but i think we can you know that's a perfect uh, circle here and we can go back to the beginning of the podcast and we're talking about karma and we're talking about karmic debt and self-identification uh, and i'll go further of uh, just watching yourself walk around and, and use, use a little bit of mindfulness in identifying the motivations that one has on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And the Tibetans have that great self-cherishing word uh, yes. that uh, I love. Uh, just start there alongside of whatever practices that you gravitate towards that help to bring awareness, period. Every moment that you're aware of the fact that you have a personality and that you it needs to be observed, that in during that moment you're observing it and it is not being able to run you around like it wants to. Yeah. So every yeah. moment there's a blessing there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're... Uh at the end of our i mean as i said we could continue we can do you know we, there should, well you're already doing everybody by the way i'm sorry to uh, not mention this at the very beginning robert has a wonderful podcast on the be here now network which we are on right now uh under mind rolling and uh noah of course who is working uh with the be here now network it's how this all came to be because he's been doing some of your stuff, Robbie. And he's been uh, like, yeah, that'd be good. I want to have a little chance here to query him on some of this. So uh, maybe we can continue uh, and have more opportunities around it. But everybody, you can tune in. What's the name of the podcast, Rob? Living with Reality is the name. Living with Reality. Aptly titled. Aptly titled. And uh, in the show notes, and I'm, I don't know, Noah may be doing them, but there'll be lots of uh, wonderful connectivity 
linking, of course, to the Agora books. And um, I wouldn't mind a little bit of linkage to Shankaracharya and uh, some of the other uh, Advaita uh, the Advaitas that you mentioned, that would be Vallabha. Vallabhacharya. Vallabhacharya. That uh -huh. intrigued me. So maybe if you can just send us uh, uh, a couple of uh, names of books we can link to or something. And uh, yeah. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Noah. Yeah. And um, I know you, you uh, I was going to say at the very beginning, when we were, before we got on and talking about, you know, you've been traveling a little bit, but nothing like you normally do, like going to India. And I was going to say, boy, I miss that. And I'm sure you do a little bit as well. And uh, you have groups uh, that hopefully will start at some point in the in the future, again, we'll be able to certainly, hopefully, by the end of next year or, the, or into early 2022, and uh, you'll let us all know about that because those Indeed. are wonderful trips. All right. This is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com, and you can catch all of these other fantastic podcasts that are there, including Robert's, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.